Hey Herb Rally folks, I'm Bridget Doherty of the Solidago Herb School and I'm here to answer your questions from my videos all about nourishing herbal infusions. So thanks so much for listening and thanks so much for commenting and questioning on the videos. I appreciate it and I'm happy to dive in and see what we can um, help you with. So the first question that I have is from Lark's Gardens and it was about the chickweed video and she says thank you Bridget for your great content plus your time energy and knowledge thank you Lark greatly appreciated when in season do you make your medicinal infusion fresh or slightly wilted I'm guessing because this is a water-based infusion fresh is best you're a great teacher and I find you easy to follow thank you so much I appreciate that um, your energy is soothing. Thank you again. So thanks so much, Lark's Gardens. Um, this is a good question. And for nourishing herbal infusions, we always use dried plant material. And there's a few reasons why we do that. So you can harvest your fresh chickweed and dry it and then use your infusion, use it for your infusion. What we're really going for with the infusions, I love to make tinctures with fresh plant material, but I find that, and some teas, especially with aromatic herbs, fresh material is great, but <clears throat> you have to use a lot more of it, you'll notice. And when we dry the plant material, we lose, you know, maybe up to 75% water. So it really kind of condenses everything else that's in that plant. I even find tea, with dried plant material, even if it's dried mint, to be a lot stronger in flavor than tea that's with fresh plant material. So I'm definitely not a stickler as far as fresh plant material in a water-based extract. I almost feel like dry is better, especially if it's good quality dried. Other reasons why we use dried plant material only in nourishing herbal infusions is one, we are able to extract the minerals better from dried plant material because We've already gone through a process where we've broken the cell walls and made those minerals more available. So when we are looking to really get what's inside the cell plant wall, the plant cell walls, we have to break apart those walls and they're so strong. Like think about a wood table, like cellulose is very strong, but, and they're so tiny that they're really, you can't like chop them. Um, because they're just so small that it doesn't really work out that way. You can't chew them apart. So we have to break those cells walls by, there's five main ways uh, to do that. One is dehydration, which is what we're doing when we're drying the plant. Uh, the other ways are cooking at a high, at, for at a high, you know, high temperature for a long period of time, so roasting. Um, or what we're doing with the infusion is we're steeping it uh, for a long period of time at a high temperature. We're putting bo boiling water over the herb and we're putting a tight lid on it, which really kind of vacuum seals it and keeps that heat in the cooking process. So we are extracting the minerals by those two processing techniques. Other ways to break the cell wall is freezing um, and covering in oil and fermentation. So that is why the other reason why we use dried plant material is because, you know, if you think about your, your herb, especially chickweed, which is so full of moisture from when you go from fresh plant material to dried plant material, you know, the fresh plant material is so much bulkier. And so it might even be hard. Let's say it's four times the weight. I don't know exactly, but on average, maybe it's four times the weight fresh material is to dried plant material. And so you'd have to actually put four times the amount of chickweed into your quart jar to get the same amount as, you know, one part of the dried chickweed. And with some herbs, that's actually really hard to do, like with stinging nettle or red clover blossom or some of these other like really kind of fluffier herbs um, and lightweight herbs, it's 
it would be really hard to put four ounces of fresh plant material into the jar versus one ounce of dry plant material into the jar. <clears throat> so, and then also the other thought I had on that was logistically, it's a lot easier if you, so you don't feel like you have to like, before you make an infusion, run outside and harvest fresh plant material or have it left over from yesterday, partly wilted. We want to make the nourishing infusions as easy to incorporate into your lifestyle as possible. And working with the dried plant material, I think allows that as well. So thanks for your question so much. I definitely, with fresh chickweed, if you're harvesting it fresh, I love to um, make a fresh chickweed pesto. Again, we're covering it in oil. So that is um, really helpful. Uh, as far as breaking the cell wall, that's one way to do it. And then the other thing is when I make a chickweed tincture, I use fresh chickweed as well. And again, we're not really going for the minerals when we're making a chickweed tincture. We're going more for the saponins and other constituents. And when I think of chickweed tincture, I think of it more as, you know, breaking up kind of cysty cysts and, um, you know, bumpy, lumpy tissue kind of, and where the infusion can do that as well because you are getting saponins in your infusion, but you're also getting a lot of minerals and nourishing qualities. So thanks so much for your question, Lark's Garden. Okay, the next question is, this is Tiger. Hi, Tiger. Um, Sheila questioned on the nettle video. I love this playlist list. Thanks so much for creating it. You did an amazing job. I'm very grateful to have all this info, info for free. Kudos. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering if you can share any sources for the info on these videos. In particular, I'm very interested to learn more about vitamin D and hear where you got the info that both nettle and chickweed do contain it, as is asserted in the vids on this playlist. I'm not sure of my sources from, com oh, and then um, she has a couple of other questions. So honestly, I when I compile a lot of the information that I do for my podcasts and for my classes and my um, anything else that I'm working on, I have a huge herbal library. I am a book collector. I have hundreds of herb books. And so I just love to go through all of my herb books, compile the information. Um, sometimes I look at scientific studies online, but mostly I'm just like reading what other herbalists have to say, and then also basing things on my own experience. So in particular, <clears throat> about the vitamin D, I did go back and look for, like I started to look for, I, and I, I could be better at this, and I apologize as far as referencing and citing where I get information. It's just... I could be better at that. I apologize. Um, so I did find, you know, some books that said, yes, there's vitamin D, especially in nettle. Other books did, you know, left that out. Um, I did find, I googled and I did find one scientific um, study that kind of cited that there was vitamin D in nettle. I did find some articles stating vitamin D in chickweed, nothing really scientifically founded. So, you know, and I didn't find a lot of information on that. So, you know, maybe that's not a huge component. Maybe I'm wrong on that. It's quite possible. And so this is another good point. Um, it's good to challenge your herb teachers or people that you're learning herbalism from. It's also good to challenge the information that they're providing you and to seek your own resources and information. Um, that being said, I will say that Vitamin D is like a very minuscule um, part of these herbs if, if they do contain it. Um, it could help with the mineral absorption that these herbs provide, the calcium, magnesium, and all the other minerals that are available. It can really help with the calcium absorption and building bones. But again, like oftentimes when I provide like, oh, it's like, you know, these herbs contain calcium, magnesium, all these things. Um, it's just so surface because really, if we were really get down to the organic chemistry of it, these herbs contain 
you know, what forms of calcium and how many different forms of calcium. And um, it's, it's kind of short, short speak, I guess, for what, what massive amounts of constituents and chemicals and nutrients that herbs contain. Um, okay, so you go on to ask, uh, ha, 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 ha. I've heard countless claims that there are very few plant-based sources of vitamin D, mostly just seaweed and fungi, and apparently the fungi only produce D2 exogenously, the way humans do with sunlight. Saja Popham, founder of the School of Evolutionary Herbalism, was very skeptical about the prospect of nettle and chickweed containing vitamin D when I asked about it in one of his classes last week. I'd be super appreciative to have the opportunity to provide Saja with your source info. Also, I'm a vegetarian, so this info is very important to me personally. If you could discuss the merits of and differences between D2 and D3, that would be very valuable knowledge as well. Okay, so sorry, Seja, I don't have the resources and and it's right to question question me on that. I will say. Um, I will say that I have I'm more sure that nettle contains a form of vitamin D than chickweed does, but um, needless to say, let's talk a little bit about vitamin D in general. So, Vitamin D, there's, again, this is like the complexity of things. There's five different vitamin D forms, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. And I'm not a biochemical expert or engineer. Like I really don't know the details on this, but from a quick kind of review online that I did, um, it seems that vitamin, there's of those five types, the D2 and the D3 are the ones that humans more often come in contact with and use and utilize in our body and create as well. So the D2 is normally found in green leaves, apparently, is what Wikipedia said. Um, and the D3 is more found in animals and is also what we can produce, because we are animals, from the sunlight. Um, and basically any form of vitamin D, D, D2, D3, whatever, it's not the vitamin D that we need in our body to help with calcium absorption and all the other benefits that vitamin D offers us. It actually has to go through multiple enzymatic processes in our body, one, at least two processes. One takes place in our liver, one takes place in our kidneys for us to turn it into what is supposedly the form that we need for it to be beneficial to us. So it's not like we take a vitamin D supplement or we eat an herb that has vitamin D in it and then bam, we have what we need. We still have to be able to process that vitamin D. We need a healthy liver, we need a healthy kidneys so that we can make use of it. Um, so that being said, you know, I did just read an article just by chance that came through on my phone recently that someone overdosed on vitamin D supplements and died um, within the past few years. So you know, there is such a thing as too much vitamin D, especially in supplement form. The other thing about vitamin D is uh, we can store it. So if you um, are out in the sun a lot in the summertime, from my understanding, and you get good exposure and good vitamin D synthesis and processing, <clears throat> then it can carry you through the winter and you still have access to it. Um, if you're really concerned about bone health and be, from being a vegetarian and you feel like your diet is inadequate as far as providing you the vitamins and minerals that you need to make a healthy body, then I think that that's something to look further into as far as, well, you know, where can I, maybe you're vegetarian and not vegan, like what? 
<clears throat> you know, possible dairy foods or animal products could I eat that would provide me with more vitamin D and calcium and magnesium. Um, the other thing that has kind of in my studies with Susan Weed in talking about vitamins and antioxidants and just like nutrition and how we absorb it and work with it is something that's really come through and I can't really uh, talk about it as clearly as I would like to because I don't even fully understand it and I don't even know if I mean I feel like science is just on the brink of understanding it too but that really it's more about the process than the product, right? So because vitamin D, you know, one, two, three, four, or five, like what is, you know, there's all these different forms of it, because we have to process it multiple times, like maybe the benefit that it offers us is within that processing action and not just the product, not just the vitamin D or not just the calciferol or whatever it is that we turn it into. So I'm not a vitamin D expert. I apologize for not having better resources and references on my work. And that is something that I can improve on. But I hope that that provides you with a little bit of insight. And um, I would say things that have been really shown to be helpful for building bones are the nourishing herbal infusions, especially nettle, red clover, comfrey, and oat straw as well as uh, what we call white food. So milk, yogurt, kefir, cheese, if you wanna stay away from actually consuming flesh. But remember, plants are animals too. Plants are people too. Like we can't get out of this karmic cycle of we need to eat life to be alive. Okay, Lynn, next question, Lynn. Top takeaways is what this was, I guess, from the full three hour. Uh, oh no, top takeaways, I guess, is, the, is one video called Top Takeaways. So she asks, is it advisable to stop taking any of these nourishing herbal infusions prior to surgery? And I would say um, not necessarily. I would say that they could actually be really beneficial leading up to surgery because you're you know, building your body, just like in physical therapy, they say, you know, you can do the physical therapy up to surgery and you're still going to be in better shape than if you didn't do the physical therapy before surgery, you know, in, in your recovery time and after surgery. And I think that these herbs are also great for after surgery as well, especially, um, the, the main five. So the red clover, comfrey, uh, nettle, oat straw, and linden. And they all have benefits in ways that they can help you. I would say that the herb that a lot of people would say, wait, red clover, you can't do that before surgery because it has coumarins in it and it has, you know, blood thinning potential. And they don't want you to have blood thinners before surgery. So that one is possible, although in the Red Clover video, um, I cited um, a book about drug, herb-drug interactions and safety and whatnot, and it basically says that in Red Clover, there's five different coumarins, types of coumarins, and they have different actions on the body. One actually might thin the butt blood, the other one might... Um, have the opposite effect on the blood. And then a couple, and then some of the other coumarins have no effect on the blood. So this is where when we consume the herb in whole form, like in the nourishing herbal infusions, and we expose ourselves to the vast array of constituents within that herb, we get way more modulation and normalization in in their effects because again they're not drugs so our paradigm is like we're so used to this concept of drugs like having a one specific direction of action like you take a drug um and it's gonna thin your blood no matter what whether your blood's already too thin or it's not thin enough no matter what it's just gonna thin your blood with herbs Herbs don't necessarily have one direction of action. In fact, they can often go 
a lot of herbs have this amphoteric effect where they could go one way or they could go the other way. And in my mind, and I don't know if this is scientifically true or not, but we're basically providing our body with a vast array of chemistry that it can pick and choose from. And our inherent innate wisdom that our body has in knowing, you know, like, oh, like, this constituent would be really helpful for me now. So this is the one that I'm going to work with and, and um, make use of. And these other ones can, can, you know, we can metabolize them, we can store them for later, we can excrete them, whatever. So um, there is some trust in the inherent wisdom of nature in, in that mindset, but I'm okay with that. Another way that we can think about these main herbal infusions and any time when we're thinking about um, combining them with a medical procedure or drugs or whatnot is we can compare them to the foods that are very similar to these herbs or that have um, actions that <clears throat> would even be more powerful than these herbs, more potent, let's say, than these herbs. So. In the case of red clover, you could ask your daughter, your doctor, would it be okay if I had beans before surgery? Because they're both in the legume family. Beans can be a lot harder on the system. Dried beans, say like black beans or soybeans or something, can be a lot harder to digest and a lot harder to break down and a lot harder to deal with on our system than red clover blossoms. Because this is like the flower of a bean plant, essentially. Comfrey, um, you can, and if we're, we're just doing the leaf, the dried leaf infusion, you know, I kind of talk about this in each specific video, but you could compare comfrey to kale. You could say, can I eat kale uh, before my surgery? And that would be on equal terms as comfrey, I would say. Stinging nettle, you could say, can I eat spinach? And in some ways, spinach is going to be more harmful to the body because it has oxalates in it than stinging nettle would be. Um, can I drink chamomile tea? And that would be in comparison to linden, both anti-inflammatory, but chamomile tends to be stronger in effect, more sedating, um, and you know people can be more likely to have allergies to chamomile. So... I feel like chamomile is like a stronger herb, but in the same sort of vein as linden blossom. And then with oat straw, uh, you could ask your doctor, can I eat oatmeal before my surgery? And that would be comparable to the oat straw itself. It's the same plant. It's just different parts of the same plant. So thank you for your question, Lynn. I hope that that clarifies to some degree. Uh, Lorinda, I wonder, does boiling water kill the nutrients? Would a water temperature of 145 degrees protect the vitamins and minerals? Thank you. So, um, no, the boiling the water won't kill the nutrients. You can't, maybe vitamin C. I mean, it's, you're not, what we're going for is the minerals and, and the protein in these infusions, mostly and other constituents. Boiling like really hot water can potentially denature some vitamins, I don't really know. Um, and it can kind of release some volatile oils, but when we're working with nourishing infusions, we're not using our herbs that have volatile oils in them. And if we think about minerals, minerals are like calcium, like chalk, um, magnesium. It's like these are like iron, uh, these are metal and rock, and they're not going anywhere. They're very stable, stable elements. And even heat, I mean, a lot of minerals are extracted from the earth by humans using, um, you know, both digging, but also separated by heat. If we think about when we burn a log at a really high temperature, we get ash. Well, what is that ash? That is the minerals. 
from that's potassium pot ash it's like the minerals from the plant um, when we cremate a body what's left are the the ash the bones the minerals so we don't have to worry. In fact, the heat is what helps us to extract the minerals from the plant material. And we really need to make a good nourishing herbal infusion. We need to have our water at like a rolling boil when it meets the plant material and then to steep at a high temperature for a while. Um, and then another note I had here on that was um, it t this ties into the whole concept of kind of like raw versus cooked food and what is better and healthier for you, what you get the nutrition from. And that ties back into a question that I answered at the beginning of this Q&A, which is... Um, you know, how do we get the nutrition from our food? How do we break it down? How do we access it? And one of those ways is by cooking um, for a long time. We really need to like break down that cellular structure so we can access what's inside it. So no, you cannot kill your nutrition or minerals from a high water temperature. And that's the whole point of the nourishing infusions is we are getting those minerals by working with high temperature water. Kavana, this is a question from the last Q&A video. I've been using nutritional infusions daily since taking the class. Awesome, thank you. Even my husband loves drinking them daily, which was a great happy surprise for me. The one question I've run into is, would this be a good infusion herb? I recall that highly aromatic herbs aren't good, as well as sedating herbs. Do you have any other guidelines of wisdom? I'm truly loving this daily herb nutrition and medicine for optimum health. Thank you, Bridget. Well, thank you, Kavana, um, for embracing this modality of gaining nutrition from herbs. So ways that I can determine whether an herb would make a good nourishing infusion is and you hit it on the head with your, um, is number one, what does it smell like? Does it have a strong scent to it? Because that's one cue that if it has a strong scent to it, it's not what we're going to be working with because we don't want to concentrate those aromatic oils because they can be hard on the liver and kidneys in large amounts over a long period of time. Um, so that's one question. That's an easy answer. And then, is this a food-like herb? Like, is this an herb that doesn't have a strong taste, doesn't have a strong, like, medicinal action, which is kind of, it's hard to say that word because medicine is such a broad word and topic, but does it have a, um, like a really strong action on the body? Is it going to, does it have like really strong antimicrobial action or does it have, you know, really strong stimulating or sedating action, whatnot? So those are going to be not the nourishing herbs. The nourishing herbs are going to be herbs like, would I put this in a soup, like stinging nettle? Or, you know, would, is this traditionally known as a pot herb, an herb that we would cook down and eat as a green? Or is this an herb that feeds cattle and domesticated animals like red clover and comfrey? Um, so these are kind of questions that are good to ask. Are, is it a fruit? Is it a berry? Is it a, you know, does this herb profile in what is inside it? Does it have protein? Does it have um, minerals and vitamins. So when we look at herbs, there are three main categories of herbs. One is nutritive, which is what we're working with, with the nourishing herbal infusions. The second is the stronger, more potent herbs. 
um, which would be the stimulating and sedating herbs. So anything, coffee is gonna be like on the top, on the highest top of that list as far as danger and extremeness, um, as far as stimulating and sedating, all the way down to chamomile, you know, or, you know, sleepy time tea kind of stuff. And then there's the poisonous herbs, which are gonna be herbs that are used medicinally in micro doses, drop doses, or that we don't use medicinally because they are poisonous. So you can first take your herb and put it in which category it lies in. And that's just that just comes with practice and learning about herbs and herbalism and reading in books and seeing what other people say as you get to know the herbs well. And then if it's in the nutritive category, great. And then you ask, wow, does this have a strong aroma? Like, I think mint, it is stimulating and sedating. It also has a lot of minerals in it, but those aromatic oils make it so that it's more leaning on the spectrum of stimulating and sedating. So we wouldn't make uh, an infusion with mint. I hope that clears that up a little bit more for you. The other thing is like, well, is it a berry? Is it, you know, like hawthorn berry? or rose hips, which leads into this next question. So Mary asks from the rose hip video, hi, how much of the rose hip to use? One ounce? Thank you so much. Yes, I would weigh out an ounce of the plant material. So for any nourishing infusion that we work with or that we use any herb, we're gonna weigh out an ounce of that plant material and it's gonna, and that's why we weigh it because it's not a volume measurement because an ounce of rose hips, you know, is a very tiny amount. They're very um, dense and concentrated and heavy. It's a heavy herb. So you're using, you know, maybe a, a few tablespoons or something to make that ounce. Whereas with red clover blossom, you're using like, you know, like this much because it's so lightweight. That's why we're doing weight measurements instead of volume measurements. So, and same with roots. If you use roots, roots are gonna be heavy and there it's gonna look like a lot less in your jar than some of the fluffier herbs. So yeah, one ounce by weight. Another question on the rose hips video from Sarah. Do you think it would help with wrinkles or crepey skin to add uh, them topically to your skin. Thanks. And I would say definitely worth a try. You could use your rose. It's not going to hurt you. And it has antioxidants, polyphenols. Um, you could use your rose hip infusion as a wipe kind of like a rinse on your face mm, and see it's, I feel like it's going to be a little sticky but um, you could leave it on for a short amount of time and then wipe it off. You could try powdering rose hips in your coffee grinder and then mixing them with like a uh, clay, French green clay and some rose water and maybe a little honey and make a face mask, you know, make it so that it's a nice pasty consistency and then put that on your face. That would be great. Um, I know that rose hip seed oil, which is actually an oil expressed from the rose hip seeds, so it's not something that we're going to be doing at home, is known as a face serum. So um, you're not going to necessarily be getting that from your rose hips, but it is a sign that there are you know healthy benefits to your skin. I mean, really nourishing from the inside out, like once we are nourished on our inside, our skin does tend to have a better uh, glow and look to it. Uh, the other thing with wrinkles is it's a fact of life. I mean, as we age, we're gonna wrinkle. And so gotta kind of come to terms with that. It's hard, I realize. Um, other ways to use rose, I mean, I really love rose petals for skincare too. Uh, just rose water that you can buy. It's the distillate, the hydrosol of rose. Um, 
rose petal tea, rose petal powdered and put on, into a face mask, rose infused honey, rose petal infused honey alone applied as a face mask. Um, yeah, I think, you know, any way that you can put roses or rose hips on your skin, your skin will benefit from it. Whether it's going to erase wrinkles and creepy skin, um, I don't know, but definitely worth a try. Okay, another rose hip video question from Jojo. Great information. Thank you for sharing your wealth of information. Thank you, Jojo. Thanks for listening. I do it for all of you. Question, won't the simmering process decrease the vitamin C? And this is quite possible. Vitamin C is like, it's a come and go kind of vitamin. It's, you know, even if you have lettuce in the fridge for 10 days or whatever, your vitamin C is going to be diminished greatly from that. So is the rose hips, are the rose hips going to be your ultimate best source of vitamin C that you can get as an infusion? Probably not. Um, you probably would benefit even more just from going outside and nibbling on some pine needles that you pull off a tree, like in the moment. Um, also, in today's day and age, uh, where we have citrus so readily available to us, and even just picking, maybe now is not the season, but in the spring, summer, fall, early winter, uh, just picking a dandelion leaf out of your yard and chewing on that is going to give you vitamin C for the day. We don't really hear a lot about scurvy um, or you know vitamin C deficiencies so much. Yes, it can help build the immune system, but I think that there's so much more to the rose hips that can help support immune health than just the vitamin C. So this is another way where if we really try to hyper focus on one chemical or one nutrient that these herbs that are full of a vast array of nutrients have and we you know kind of try to cherry pick that one nutrient we can get into trouble not only for thinking that one specific type of nutrient is what we need for our health because that's like the whole drug supplement paradigm i mean is it really even just vitamin C or is that just shorthand for what is actually the chemical makeup of what is in that rose hip? Is it ascorbic acid? Is it, um, I, you know, I don't know. Again, I'm not a, a chemistry <laughs> buff or even very, it all kind of starts confusing me when we get really micro like that. And so I think it does for a lot of people and that's why we have these big terms like vitamin C or vitamin D or, you know, it's, it simplifies it. But I think that a lot of the inherent complexity gets lost in our simplification of, of vocabulary and how we talk about these nu nu nutrients. So short of the long is even probably just drying the rose hips, there's not much vitamin C left in there, but there's tons of bioflavonoids, which are also really important. Um, eating a fresh rose hip right off the vine is probably how you're gonna get the most vitamin C from that plant. Okay, Lark's Gardens, again, um, this was from the Q&A video. Thank you, Bridget. With all that being said, tinctures are used medicinally. Would allergies be best treated with an infusion or a tincture? Would using as a nervine be better taken as an infusion or a tincture? So this is a great question. And this question definitely falls more along the lines of um, chronic herbal care and acute herbal care to some degree. So if we look at stinging nettle for allergy relief, um, stinging nettle as a nourishing herbal infusion is really over the long term 
going to reduce your allergic reactions by far. Um, but it's not going to be an overnight or immediate thing. If you're having an allergy attack and you drink a nourishing herbal infusion of nettle, it might not work like a Benadryl or antihistamine. It's not going to necessarily be immediate effect. But if you know that you get spring allergies, pollen allergies, and you drink nettle infusion all winter, then you're going to find in the spring like, wow, I just am not reacting as much as I used to. So that's like really working on, you know, building the nutrition and building the your body up so that it's just healthier overall. Now, when I worked in the herbal pharmacy, we sold in the spring a ton of freeze-dried stinging nettle capsules and nettle tincture made from the fresh plant material. And from my understanding, that's because when we work with the fresh plant, when we extract the fresh plant or we freeze it, then we are holding on to one of the main antihistamines that from my understanding, I could be wrong, is actually in the sting of the nettle. It's like contained in the trichomes um, that is part of what stings us and gives us that rash and irritation from nettle. And when we dry the plant, those tri those trichomes disappear and, you know, they don't, what's inside them disappears and is denatured. And that's why we don't get stung by dried stinging nettle. So, um, if you have made a fresh tincture, a tincture from fresh stinging nettle and you work with it while you are actually having an allergy attack, then it might help to ease that attack in the moment. Different, diff So that's the kind of difference between an infusion and a tincture of nettle in dealing with allergies. And the same can go um, again with your question about nervines. So oat straw is considered a nervine. Um, and when we drink it as a nourishing herbal infusion, like, yeah, we might feel calmer and like more at ease in a day while we're drinking our oat straw infusion. But really where it gives us benefit is over the long term. Like if we have oat straw infusion once or twice a week for months, then overall we're going to be less stressed or more able to deal with stress in our environment and in our world and we'll be more like calm, cool, and collected in general. Less easily ruffled, I would say. Now, the other part of the oat is the milky oat tops, the fresh milky oat tops, which again is different than the dried oat straw. You're actually getting that white, um, I believe it's a, it's like, um, it's, it's almost like a resin or it's a type of resin, that white goop. Latex, it's like a latexy resin type of thing. And that specific part of the oat that is like right in its ripe stage between flowering and, and creating a seed, it's like its ripe fruit stage. If you take that, if you dry it, it starts to denature that constituent. So if you harvest it and you make a fresh tincture with it, a fresh plant tincture with it, the tincture, the alcohol in the tincture is going to extract and concentrate that main constituent from the herb. And it has a much more sedating effect. Like again, it's like the nutritive herb versus the sedative stimulant aspect of the herb. Um, is So you're going to get a lot more of an acute response with that tincture of the milky oat top versus a nourishing herbal infusion of the oat straw. But you're not going to be getting the minerals from the tincture. And honestly, as I think we have come to find out, calcium and magnesium are very important for everything in our body, but they're also really important for our nervous system and just helping um, to keep us calm. So with the oat straw, 
Nourishing Herbal Infusion, you're getting a lot more and you're getting long lasting Nervine effects. With the tincture of the Milky Oat Tops, you're getting more of an acute in the moment. I'm freaking out. I need to calm down. I can hardly breathe. Or I'm like, have had insomnia. I'm so stressed. I have so much anxiety in my mind. That's going to be the time that the Milky Oak Top tincture can be more helpful. So I hope that clarifies that for you. Maya on the Astragalus video. Thank you for the video. Is it possible to make a tincture from it and mix it with ashwagandha root? I have a very small root of Astragalus. I'm not sure how to benefit from it. You can totally make a tincture of Astragalus. So that is fine and work with it in that form. People do. Um, but for me, like I think that we get more from the infusion, um, more polysaccharides, which is what is like really immune supporting, um, which are like long chain sugars and you can just taste them in the infusion. But as like a daily adaptogenic kind of tonic, you could have a, a stragglers tincture that you take a squirt or two or three of or a teaspoonful of. Again, it's like you're just ingesting vastly smaller quantity of the herb material in the tincture versus the infusion. But you have only a very small amount of herb material. And so I'm wondering like with this small root that you have, is it because you harvested the small root? Um, did you, you know, take the plant's life to harvest this root or did someone give it to you? And in that sense, it would almost be a shame to be like, well, how am I going to use it? And then is, I mean, maybe a small root is maybe an ounce, right? So maybe it would be worthy of one nourishing herbal infusion or like one, you could put it in your bone broth or you could put it in, you know, whatever soup you're cooking and it would bubble out and would get all the nutrition for that one pot of soup. Um, so if, if it's a small amount of root, no matter what you do with it, you're going to get a small amount of effect from it. And a thought that came to me was if this was a plant that you had um, a relationship with and that you harvested and inevitably gave death to, to have this root from it, maybe there's more of like an um, uh, energetic or spiritual way that you could work with the plant um, to gain other benefits from it, whether it's carry it as a charm or make a cool piece of jewelry out of it, um, put it on an altar, put it under your pillow, have, do dream work with it. Um, you know, what for the biggest, you know, mileage that you can get in a healing journey with one small astragalus root, it might be more beneficial on a more ethereal plane than just by consuming it. Cause I mean, it's basically like having one carrot, you know, it's like, okay, I ate that carrot and now I have the nutrition from it, but now it's gone. And, um, I just, an astragalus plant I feel like is a little sacred. Um, as far as combining it with ashwagandha root, again, I'm more of a simpler. If it were me and I wanted to make a tincture out of this um, one small astragalus root that I had, I would make it by itself and honor that, honor the plant in that tincture. And then if I had my ashwagandha tincture um, as well, then I could take, and I wanted to work with the two herbs together, then in the moment I could take a little bit of ashwagandha, a little bit of astragalus, put them in a shot glass with some water and drink it that way. But I would not it just, it just feels a little disrespectful in general, like this whole kind of processing of, I have a small tincture. I want to get, I have a small root. I want to get the most from it. Can I just put it with another root and, and be good with it? And like, but for me, it's like, well, how can you really like fully honor and appreciate this one astragalus root that you have and, and, uh, work with it in more of a sacred manner. 
Okay, Darlene from the Q&A video. Uh, so I cannot tincture hawthorn berries and get the benefits, question mark. I'm looking specifically for the blood pressure lowering benefit. And no, I'm sorry, there's confusion there. I'm sorry I confused you with my answer uh, at the last about hawthorn. You can definitely tincture hawthorn berries and definitely get great benefit from them. If you have fresh hawthorn berries, you wanna fill your jar all the way to the top with the fresh hawthorn and then cover it with 100 proof vodka. Fill it all the way with 100 proof vodka. You just have to like let it sit for six weeks at the minimum, maybe a year would be great. And same with the dried hawthorn berries you would fill your jar no more than a half, between a half and a quarter full of the hawthorn berries and then fill your jar all the way up with 100 proof vodka. And eventually those berries will absorb that vodka and swell and swell and swell to fill the jar. Um, so no, definitely tincture your berries. You might even get more benefit from a hawthorn berry tincture than a hawthorn berry infusion. I mostly, my hawthorn infusions, I do with the leaves and the flowers, and that's what I find I get some good benefit from. Um, definitely go ahead and tincture hawthorn berries to get the benefits. And if you really wanna know a lot more about hawthorn, um, I will be doing a video, I realized I didn't do one for this course, but I will be doing one for Herb Rally soon. Um, but also, so stay tuned for that, but also check out my podcast, the healthier podcast episode 92 has, is all about Hawthorne. It's like an hour long, uh, Hawthorne class. So you get all the information you could possibly want and surely more on that episode. Thanks for your question, Darlene. Okay. 12 pretty things. Q and a video. Hi, I really enjoy your content. The one herb at a time mantra sounds amazing. My question is how to best incorporate all the herbs we wanna take daily if we wish to address multiple concerns. For example, speaking for myself, I have a long history of heart issues in my family, so heart strengthening herbs are one concern. I also have a lot of stress in my life due to being sued and the unrelenting bills that have so far forced me to take money out of my retirement. Also, I wish to be as cognitively sharp as I can, and I was dealing with a lot of brain fog, which seems to have lifted some with tinctures that are blends. I welcome any suggestions, thank you. I uh, hope the holidays are peaceful for you and the folks in your life. Thank you, 12 pretty things. Um, I did have a good holiday season and so you can definitely work with multiple herbs in a day, no problem. But I find that if we work with them as simples, each, you know, each herb in its own preparation, then from day to day, we can alter our course. You know, we can say, wow, like, I really feel like today I would like to focus more on my brain fog herb than on my part herb. Like maybe I'll take two tincture, two dropperfuls of ginkgo or rosemary or whatever it is that I'm working with for brain fog uh, relief. Then, um, you know, I'm feeling like loved and my heart feels good. I haven't had any palpitations in a while. Maybe I only need one dropper full of hawthorn berry tincture where if you are doing them in formulas, you really don't have that type of control or sensitivity. Um, if you say, wow, I, I have a heart issue and a brain issue and a stress issue, I'm gonna take one of each of those herbs, put them in a formula, and then all I have to do is take one preparation all day. That is easy, um, but in that one dose of that preparation, are you really getting enough of each one of those herbs is one thought and concern. Um, also, one herb could have enough complexity to help you deal with all three of those things, potentially. Or a rotation of the nourishing herbal infusions could definitely help 
with all three of those concerns. Maybe even just stinging nettle alone could help with all three of those concerns over a long period of time. So I still stand by the simpling, but definitely working with multiple herbs within a day or even in any moment, but just having the freedom to pick and choose. And we are such varied people. Like in one day, we go through so many changes. And so, you know, it would be nice that if our remedies could also be flexible as flexible as we are and again that takes this like paradigm shift away from i take drugs as medicine they're standardized it's the same amount of drug every day morning and night down to the micro whatever portion uh, micro digit but we aren't like that as humans like we aren't the same every day and every moment and the beauty of herbs is that neither are they nor they nor do they have to be and that tends to work for us if we can trust in it so that was one thought i had on that um what other thoughts had there were some multiple things that came up for me with this question oh yeah um so herbs that I would think of, oh, one thing again is working with formulas. And then I'll just maybe say like my top herb suggestions for those three things that you're dealing with. But um, I would say, you know, you have this brain fog formula. Do you know it's a formula? Do you know what herbs are in it? How many herbs are in it? What would happen if you, uh, it's really working for you, you don't have brain fog, is this like long term you don't have brain fog or do you have to take the formula every time to like seek to find clarity and if that's the case what happens if the person who makes the formula stops making it or if for whatever reason they're out of it or you can't purchase it then then what happens you have to start over you have to figure out how to make your own formula is this a formula that you make i don't know but this is one thing around the whole concept of when we go out and we purchase a formula and start taking it and sure it's maybe it works maybe it works great but we are now beholden to not only that formula that we don't know exactly what it is or how to make it we might know what herbs are in it but do we know the exact amounts of each herb and how they're processed and you know it's it's it is really taking the medicine out of our hands, which for me, herbal medicine is putting the medicine back into our hands, putting the power, the empowerment of healing back into our own hands. And so if you no longer have that formula available to you, then you have to start over. But if you were working specifically with one or two herbs within that formula, say that formula has rosemary and ginkgo biloba in it, and you have two tinctures, one of rosemary and one of ginkgo, then you are all set. You can, you, the power is in your hands. And not only is the power in your hands, but now you can tell your friends and families, wow, I've been working with these herbs and my brain fog has totally cleared. Um, and they can ask, well, what herbs? It's like, well, I have a tincture of rosemary and a tincture of ginkgo. And I just kind of go with my intuition as far as what to take when and how it feels based on listening to my body and how I'm responding to these herbs. That your family can be like, oh, I can go out and easily get a tincture of rosemary and a tincture of ginkgo. Great. We'll go do that. And we'll, we'll do it ourselves. And then that puts the power in their hands. But then if instead you have this brain fog formula that's by a certain company that you get at a certain store or a certain online place, and they say, oh, and your friends are like, oh, I've got brain fog. Oh, I have this like perfect remedy for you. Um, and they're like, oh, what is it? Oh, it's called brain ease or whatever. And it's by this company. And and um, they'll go, okay, well, I guess I'll go get that. But now they, they're they more removed from what the herbs are and what the remedy is. Now it's just a formula that they purchase. It's not rosemary, you know. So I want to bring it back to it being rosemary, which is one herb that I would consider working with. 
uh, for brain fog relief and then stress relief, the adaptogens, nettle, like seriously, just working through the five main herbal infusions would be so beneficial. Um, Shizandra berry is my, was, has been my go-to for stress lately uh, as a tincture, as an infusion. Um, yeah, and Hawthorne is great. Hawthorne is great for the heart. And Hawthorne also is great for the nervous system in dealing with stress. And it's also really beneficial for um, a brain, for brain functioning, because basically Hawthorne improves blood circulation throughout the whole body. Um, and so it helps to, and to your extremities. And it also helps with um, nervous system issues because our heart and our nervous system are so closely tied together. Usually herbs that benefit the heart benefit the nervous system. And usually herbs that benefit the heart and help to like bring circulation uh, more properly to the far reaching parts of our body um, tend to be beneficial for our brain function as well because the brain and the heart and the blood flow is also really super linked together. So I hope that sheds some light on your question. Okay, Kathy, Red Clover. Can you tell me what in your opinion would be best for nerve tissue inflammation? And I think you mean for relieving nerve tissue inflammation or for, yeah, because we don't want to cause nerve tissue inflammation. I'm making a turmeric black pepper tincture, but looking for more advice. I have red clover, but it's powdered sadly. Should I capsule it? Not sure it would make an herbal infusion. It's a wonderful herb. So for the question on nerve tissue, I would say definitely St. John's wort or otherwise known as St. Jones wort tincture and infused oil from the fresh flowering tops. Um, the botanical name is Hypericum, Hypericum perforatum. And this herb is specific for nerve pain, nerve inflammation, um, and any sort of nerve regeneration. Taking the tincture internally, rubbing the oil on topically, um, both are just going to be really, really helpful but it has to be made from the fresh plant material. And they both, both the tincture and the oil have to have like this really ruby red, like this deep red color to them to show that they're gonna be truly effective. Um, turmeric and black pepper, I would say for any type of inflammation in the body, I would stay clear of hot, spicy herbs like black pepper, cayenne, even ginger, even though ginger is known as an anti-inflammatory. And you know, unless if you're like really cold and you need circulation to your extremities. Turmeric, um, I know everyone says you need to put black pepper with your turmeric for it to, for it to work well. Um, the one thing with turmeric is that it is a great anti-inflammatory but you really have to take it in large amounts. It's a food-like herb. It's a nutritive herb. It's one that, um, you know, it's a by the tablespoon, powders by the tablespoon in milk kind of thing to really get the benefit from it. And, you know, the whole thing with adding black pepper, I guess, I mean, I think the concept behind that is that it helps increase the circulation and carry the turmeric around. Maybe there's some chemistry there, but um, I don't know. I just don't know about it all. Uh, so maybe I won't say anymore. But the other thing that I would consider is Linden Nourishing Herbal Infusion. Check out that video. Wonderful anti-inflammatory. So soothing. Um, and and I think is a better anti-inflammatory or inflammation modulator than turmeric is. And it's a lot more enjoyable to ingest. Red clover powder, maybe you could put it in smoothies um, or in like baking, maybe. Um, you know, muffin, you know, add it to your flour mix for muffins or something, bread or something like that. I've never done that, but you could try it. 
putting it in capsules, again, like you're gonna need an ounce per serving size. And that's a lot of capsules. It's a lot of gelatin. Um, and the whole thing about herbs and capsules is that the idea is that when you take a capsule and drugs and capsules too, is it goes, it's protected from the stomach acid to some degree, especially in enteric coated ones. And that it goes through your system without digesting, without like breaking it down and extracting the goodness from it. It's more designed for non-nutritive herbs, herbs that you really just want kind of the more poisonous constituents from, um, because that you can kind of get on the surface without having to like really break them down. So I don't know, I kind of feel like maybe the red clover powder and is it blossom powder or is it leaf powder? The leaf powder, people tend to have more adverse effects to red clover leaf than the blossom. I'm guessing it might be leaf powder. Um, you could feed it to your house plants. You could put it in your compost pile, feed it to your chickens. Um, you could sprinkle it in a ceremony offering to the earth. Uh, you know, maybe similar to the astragalus question, you could work with it more on an ethereal plane than actually like trying to get nutrition and medicinal benefit from it on a physical plane. And Kathy as well, uh, another question from you on the comfrey. I'm making one now with yarrow, comfrey, and a little tart cherry. Is this a good combination? So nourishing infusions are not made with a yarrow. Yarrow is an herb that is has a lot of volatile oils to it, highly scented. So we're not going to use yarrow in a nourishing infusion. Yarrow in tea is fine. If you make a yarrow tea and you pour some into your comfrey infusion to change the flavor, and if you want yarrow medicine in your life, then that might be the better way to go about it. Um, a little tart cherry, again, you could add that as flavoring after you make your comfrey infusion. But if you're going to make a comfrey infusion, just make it with comfrey leaf, one ounce weighed out, put in a jar, then you know, you're getting the right amount, you know that you are, um, getting your comfrey and then after you strain it you can mix and match whatever you want in there if you if the flavor doesn't work for you or if you are working with multiple herbs in a day and it's just easier for you to put them all in one cup you can do that but let's keep them all separate first and then mix and match as we see necessary and yarrow um, is not a long infusion herb because it's not super nutritive. I'm sure that there are some minerals in there, um, but it's more medicinal. It has more of a um, more stronger medicinal action than some of our more nutritive herbs. This concludes our Q and A session for Herb Rally. Thank you, everyone, so much for sending in your questions. I hope that my answers suited you and have given you more to ponder and think about. Um, check me out, list, check me out on my podcast, the Healthy Herb Podcast. And I have 93 episodes so far, so there is tons of content there for you to dive into uh, given the time. And feel free to reach out again through this channel, ask more questions on the Herb Rally videos, and I'll do another Q&A when we have a bunch to go through. In the meantime, enjoy your day, be well, let intuition guide you, and have fun with herbs. <laughs>